hymn of praise is number eight. All hail the power of Jesus' name. <laughs>
Whenever I was preparing a message or trying to find out what to uh, share with you on this Sunday, uh, the calendar sort of throws you a curveball every now and then. Uh, quite often, the Sunday after Thanksgiving tends to be the first Sunday in Advent. Well, not so this year. Um, it's about two out of every seven years this happens. So today is sort of a standalone Sunday, then the next four will be Advent followed by Christmas Day. So sort of thinking, what should I do with this one Sunday, you know? Well, based on the sermon title called Preparation for Advent, that was the direction that I took it. Um, we can't just sort of forget that Advent is coming. I mean, you look in the uh, stores and there's Christmas trees and Christmas music and all that kind of stuff, and it's been that way for at least a good month now. So, of course, we can't ignore that kind of stuff. So anyway, as I said, this will be uh, beginning the Advent season, and to clarify, it's not the Christmas season yet. Uh, people call it the Christmas season, uh, according to the church, the Christmas season doesn't start until Christmas Day. And then you have the 12 days of Christmas, it's where we get that song about the partridge in the pear tree. That extends into January and so forth. But this will be, next week, will be the first Sunday in Advent. So, for a pre-Advent message, um, I want to begin by sharing with you something that certainly will not surprise you, and that is that by far the biggest complaint of people about what I'll call the Christmas season, we know it's not Christmas, I mean Advent, I'm just using the secular terminology there, is that it is too busy and too stressful. Well, that's what I'd like to caution you about this morning, is something that we may not think that much about, but caution you against creating idols during the Christmas or Advent season. It's very easy to do, actually, and oftentimes people don't even know that they're doing it until uh, Christmas uh, has passed. So we'll start by looking at the uh, Bible, our passage of scriptures from the Old, Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, and we'll just look at about four verses there, it is Jeremiah chapter 2, and if you're following on your, in your pew Bible, it's on page 535. So while you're finding that in your Bibles, just sort of a background is that God is warning the Israelites that they need to give up their idols and return to him as the one and true only God. And then he also points out the absurdity of resorting to idol worship. And again, we'll find the uh, passage on page 535 of your pew Bible if you're following there. And reading from Jeremiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 25, it says, Do not run until your feet are bare and your throat is dry. But you said, It's no use. I love foreign gods and I must go after them. As a thief is disgraced when he is caught, so the house of Israel is, is disgraced. They, their kings and their officials, their priests and their prophets. They say to wood, you are my father, and to stone, you gave me birth. They have turned their backs to me and not their faces. Yet when they are in trouble, they say, come and save us. Where then are the gods you made for yourselves? Let them come if they can save you when you are in trouble. For you have as many gods as you have towns, O Judah. The Lord's blessing be added to the reading and hearing of his holy word. The very first verse of that passage, Jeremiah 2.25, God says, Do not run until your feet are bare and your throat is dry. First I was going to ask rhetorically if... Uh, if you know how often, if you have ever experienced that, but on second thought, I should say, how often does this happen? Not does it happen to you, but how often? Because I feel this is a very common thing even Christians deal with. 
God doesn't want us to get so busy running after something else to take his place in our lives. We go to the next line. He says, but you said it's no use. I love foreign gods and I must go after them. Sadly, I think this is how many people feel during December with Christmas, you know, coming very soon. By their actions, we get the sense that some people are bound and determined to go after these other gods of getting the perfect Christmas tree up, getting the perfect uh, outdoor light display. Um, by the way, you can't have that. I have that, so that's at home. Uh, or I will in a couple days once I get a few of my deer to be lighting properly. Um, going after and trying to get the perfect Christmas dinner cooked. Getting the nicest cards out in the mail. Uh, again, decorating and getting a tree up. Buying the perfect Christmas present for that special someone by searching after all of these gods that we have created in our mind, people create a lot of unnecessary stress during the holiday season. You're probably familiar with the old singer Andy Williams. He was the man who sang the classic Christmas song, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. Andy passed away about six years ago, but I really can't imagine going through a whole Christmas season without hearing that song. There is a parody version of this song that was recorded quite some time ago, and it gets a little bit of a chuckle, and I'll just share <coughs> part of it with you this morning. It says, it's the most stressful time of the year. You've got to go shopping from mall to mall hopping, can't find what you need. It's the most stressful time of the year. It's the stress, stressfulest season of all. The store's overheated, by crowds you're defeated, the lines are too long. It's the most stressful time of the year. <coughs> Is that a little more true than what we'd like to admit? And it's ironic too because this, during this season that leads to the celebration of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we run the risk of falling farther and farther away from Him as we fill our lives with all these extra things. Now we should expect non-Christians to not care a whole lot about Jesus during this season. And I always am confused how people who don't worship Jesus still celebrate Christmas but they do what they want to do, I guess. But I do think we should expect more than that from Christian believers. I see way too many people wake up on December 26th and basically give a big sigh of relief that the whole thing, that the whole thing is over and now we can move on with the rest of our lives and really forget that the last four or five weeks have ever even happened. So I'd like to call attention to verse 27 in Jeremiah 2. This is another verse where we sort of need to understand a bit of the culture of the day to know what's going on. Probably sounds a little strange me reading it without the background earlier. But it says, they say to wood, you are my father, and to stone, you gave me birth. Now what in the world is that supposed to mean? That was my question whenever I read this the first time. Well, the fact is that the two primary gods of the Canaanites at the time, the pagans of the land, were Baal and Asherah. Baal was the male deity of stone, and Asherah was the female deity of wood. That's why you have this phrase, you are my father and you gave me birth. But there's a little quirk in this, though. If you go back and read it, it still doesn't make sense. It seems to be the opposite of what you would expect. So what God is doing in his uh, message to the Israelites, he's sort of maybe being funny or being uh, like throwing a parody at it, that kind of thing, where he switches the male and female characteristics. So again, he says, they say to wood, which is the female deity, you are my father. And to stone, which is the male deity, you gave me birth. It's called satire. 
We do that a lot of times even today. And God is using this to illustrate the absurdity of by being absurd. He's saying, you guys are so off the mark that you don't even know who you're serving. And it's absurd to chase after false gods no matter what form they take. We see this in the way that fads come and go. Every year it seems like a new iPhone comes out and they had the iPhone 10 and that replaced the old iPhone. You would think it would have been the iPhone 9, but apparently there was not an iPhone 9. It was the iPhone 8. Apparently someone at Apple can't count. I don't know. <laughs> but do you think that when the iPhone 10 came out, anyone wanted the iPhone 8 anymore? No, not really, unless it got to be really, really cheap because there's a better version on the market now. So why do I want this old one when this one can do this, that, and the other thing? Well, we're very good at creating idols because we never seem to be satisfied with what we have. And to this point, God goes further by in verse 28 saying, where then, where then are the gods you made for yourselves? Let them come and save you if you're in trouble. Apparently, God is where I get my sarcastic streak because apparently he has one too. Now, just take a minute in your minds and think back to last Christmas, about 11 months ago. Okay, go through this list that I rattled off earlier. The Christmas lights display, the perfect dinner cooked, uh, the nicest cards out in the mail on time, decorating the tree, buying the gifts for everyone. And of course, they aren't the only things that people agonize over, but here's what I'm getting at. Sitting here right now, November 25th, 2018, those things from last year, how much did they matter in the big scheme of things? Are we still talking about the Christmas dinner that we had last year? Probably not, you know, unless something really significant happened during the dinner. But the thing is, that stuff probably doesn't isn't lasting. And it's because we all know that those things are just here today and gone tomorrow. God is the only one who is going to last, and he makes it very clear in the words in Jeremiah 2. Here and many places elsewhere in the New Testament, we read, or the Old Testament, we read of these wooden poles that were stuck in the ground that represent this wood god named Asherah. And this is one of man's many attempts to create a god to replace the real true uh, true thing. I find it interesting that archaeologists to this day can go among the ruins of these ancient civilizations and see what is left. Do you think they see any wooden poles stuck in the ground from 3,000 years ago? No. That wood has rotted away a very, very long time ago and dissolved into the ground that archaeologists suggest maybe you can see some slightly discolored soil at the, at the most where these post holes were, those gods did not remain, nor will any gods remain that we establish at Christmas time. Pastor John MacArthur once told a story of a little girl who was passing out presents to her family at Christmas. And after finding gifts for each member of the family, she was puzzled that there was not a gift under the tree for the one whose birth was being commemorated. She said, I guess everyone forgot about Jesus. Let's not be the one who forgets about Jesus. If, any, or if we wonder how any true believer can miss the real meaning of Christmas, just look at the Bible. Who was there on the night Jesus was born? We know two Jewish individuals for sure, Joseph and Mary, and uh, some of the shepherds later that night were uh, told of the birth as well. Weren't the Jewish people the ones who were supposed to be waiting for the Messiah to come? Yet almost all of them missed it. 
They missed the most amazing sight and sound show that you could ever imagine that would ever be visible on earth. As in the darkness of the night, a light brighter than the shining of the noonday sun shone around the multitude of the heavenly host and appeared to them and said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The Bible even tells us that men from the east who were almost certainly from a pagan tradition and not a Jewish background were watching and waiting for this star to shine in the heavens on the night Jesus was born. God's own people were largely unaware of what was going on, but even these pagan men knew. They weren't going to miss out on this, but the Bible is full of people who do miss out on finding God. Remember that all but eight people in the whole world missed getting on Noah's Ark, and the rest perished. Fast forward to year 1 AD. We see all of Judea, except for a few, missing out on the birth of Jesus. You see, it was, it's not all that uncommon for people to miss out on the glory of God. And sadly, many miss it every time that Christmas rolls around. And you know what? Missing the importance of the season could be a sign that should Jesus return today, those same people may miss that too. The Bible tells us that Christ will come in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. And you see, we know that we have until December 25th, more or less, whenever we schedule our uh, Christmas get-togethers to get all of our gifts purchased, have our cards out in the mail, do all the other things we need to prepare for the festivities. But we don't know what day Jesus' second coming will be. Just think of it this way. If Jesus' second coming were, uh, or if Christmas was like what Jesus' second coming will be, we would always have some gifts ready, stashed away in case this is the day. We'd always have a ham in the refrigerator ready to pop in the oven and get done very soon. We'd always have some Christmas cards on the shelf ready to go. We would always have our tree up and decorated. In that case, you probably wouldn't want a live one because it would dry out and it would be a fire hazard, but don't overthink the analogy here. The point is we would always be thinking about Jesus and wondering, is this the day he's going to come? In the same way during the Christmas season, we always should be thinking about Jesus rather than all these other things that tend to distract us. And of course, don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying all these other things are bad because they're certainly not the presents, the cards, the food, the trees, and everything. But they're not the end all of the Advent season. They are means that we use to have a more festive season but they can't be our focus during that season. Remember the bumper sticker that you probably see every now and then? He is the reason for the season. And it sounds a little cliche, maybe a little hokey, but it is very true. Jesus is the reason for the season. His name is on the holiday. Christ Mass is what we celebrate yet a lot of people still leave him out of this holiday season. So before I close, I'd like to go back to the verse that we opened up with. In verse 25, do not run until your feet are bare and your throat is dry. Back in those times, that was a common image of slavery. Having nothing on your feet, meant that you couldn't afford anything. You were someone else's slave. And having a dry throat meant that you couldn't even get a drink whenever you needed it. It was the life of a typical slave. God's taking the image and connecting it to being a slave to idols. So the connection that I make is don't be a slave to the things of the season. And by all means, we can indulge in them and enjoy them, but don't be enslaved to them. Instead, be a slave to Jesus Christ, as the Apostle Paul put in his letters. Know that the Advent season has the potential, has great potential, to draw us ever closer to God. And 
the enemy knows that too, and he'll stop at nothing to get in the way of that. I have this image of my, in my mind of the devil laughing his head off at the person who runs themselves ragged on Christmas Eve, getting the house clean, cooking dinner, entertaining guests, and then trying to get them out the door in time to hurry over to church for the Christmas Eve service. That way they can hold a candle, whisper a prayer, and then you know, get back to what they were doing before. I bet through all of that, Satan is just laughing his head off, knowing that he was successful in taking our attention away from God during this holiday season that is meant to bring honor and glory to him. Don't let the devil rob you of this joy. Even if it means you cut something here or there out of your schedule during the holiday season. What's going to last is not the trees, the presents, and the fruitcake. What will last are the memories and the love that's shared with family and fellow believers in Jesus Christ. And more importantly, your enhanced relationship with God when you consider the greatest gift that you could ever receive is courtesy of Him, His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and pray at this time. Father God, as we look forward to the Advent season, we know that it can be over-commercialized, and we've been seeing commercials on television and hearing them on the radio for some time, and we've already had the Black Friday shopping behind us. And again, there's nothing wrong with those things, and sometimes you can show more love to a person by really giving them a thoughtful gift, and that's a great thing. But Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would remind us over the next month that Jesus Christ really is the reason for the season. His name is in the holiday. It is Christ's Mass. It is all about him. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would keep reminding us of that every day if need be. We'll close out our service this morning by singing together our hymn of dedication. It is number 126. We're marching to Zion.